Condensed matter physics. What is it and what is it for? What is then a condensed matter system? What characterizes a condensed matter system is first of all a very large number of constituents. These constituents can be molecules, electrons, atoms. The other characteristic is that between these constituents there are strong interactions strong meaning compared with respect to the kinetic energy. These leave us with basically two types of condensed matter systems, solids and liquids. Other systems like plasmas, gas, molecules can be excluded, except for very large molecules like carbon and tubes, if we consider carbon and tubes as a molecule, or DNA. How to study condensed matter systems? So, condensed matter uh, can be approached in two ways, basically. One, that is the subject of condensed matter physics, considering that the physical properties of a system can be deduced from its atomic structure. And this, of course, needs then to, to, to the contribution of quantum physics. The other approach is considering uh, a system as a continuum media. That means that at any scale, basically the physical properties are the same. So why condensed matter is important? First of all, because it can help us to understand our world. Why water is wet, why there are hard and soft materials, why if you feel that uh, some metals are cold, or how biological systems work. In every one of these systems, we have a large quantity of atoms or, or molecules and strong interactions. Condensed matter physics help us, in fact, in everyday life. Devices, structures, many of our technological world depends on our knowledge on the physics of material from its intimate constituents. And if we fail to well understand this, then we can have problems like a device that is going to burn, or here you see this railway that has been deformed because thermal expansion was not correctly considered. Our world is facing important challenges in the 21st century. This uh, concerns changes in the climate, this concerns the production of energy for an increasing world population, or to f how to tackle the new diseases appearing. So for all these we need new materials and to understand new concepts in physics. And this is one of the very important contributions that can have condensed matter physics. Condensed matter physics can be of importance in fundamental science. We need uh, state-of-the-art instrumentations to be able to detect gravitational waves or observe uh, new exoplanets. We uh, can discover exotic states of matter at very high pressure, like metallic hydrogen, or um, discover also new advanced mathematical tubes to study topological matter. Find also why there is life on Earth or in other exoplanets. This depends on our understanding of the physical properties of matter at extreme conditions. So in all this, condensed matter physics can be of real importance too. Condensed matter physics then is a real bridge between the quantum world and the macroscopic world, the world that we can touch. Examples of macroscopic properties that we need then to derive from the atomistic nature of matter can be density, melting point, heat of fusion or electrical resistivity, mechanical properties of the young modulus and many others. In this table, we can see that macroscopic properties uh, in different materials can have values that differ in orders of magnitudes. That means that we have a real challenge to understand why this can be so different. If we have a look, for instance, here, we make a zoom, 
and we take a property like electrical resistivity. Materials like paraffin and silver, which are best conductor for silver, one of the worst for paraffin, that have difference in the electrical resistivity of 18 orders of magnitude. This is enormous, a real challenge. So how condensed matter physics is organized? We can differ, we can make the difference between two types of uh, systems, what we call hard matter, soft matter. Well, what makes real the difference is the interaction between the constituents. When these interactions are weaker, this can be Van der Waals interactions or hydrogen bond, then we will talk about soft matter. When they are stronger, we talk about hard matter. And in soft matter, we can have different types of uh, liquids like colloidal dispersions, polymer melts on solutions, liquid crystals, and also biomaterials in which we have membranes, proteins, nucleic acids in interaction. In hard matter, we have uh, stronger bonds uh, dominated by ionic interaction or covalent bonds, for instance. Some of the materials have periodic uh, properties, and then we talk about crystals, and other are non crystalline solids, including quasicrystals, amorphous, or polymer solids. Then we can also introduce some imperfection in the periodicity, and this leads to very interesting physical properties. So, all this is what we call hard matter physics. And also called solid state physics that is an important branch of condensed matter physics and we are going to talk about crystalline solid ma mainly so the main challenge in condensed matter is that we are going to deal with a number of particles in interaction that is, are, is really huge compared with really with avogadro's number so fortunately physics is having all the necessary tools to construct this bridge between the quantum world and the macroscopic world. Of course, quantum physics itself, a statistical physics because we are dealing with a large number of particles, electromagnetism because of the nature of the interaction of many of these particles, thermodynamics, which is the macroscopic view of all the interactions between particles, and other tools like or periodicity, uh, the use of quasi-particles, that is a way to treat many particles as a single one, and perturbation theories and other mathematical methods. Let's uh, have a look to, to the quasi-particle concept, which is central in, in, in simplifying calculations and theories in condensed matter physics. So what, what's a quasi-particle? It's basically a many-body system or subsystem which can be treated within a single particle Hamiltonian. And this makes things much easier. For instance, here, the first one, the electrons. Electrons are particles themselves, but when we consider electrons in a solid, for instance, or in a crystal, uh, we, we need to consider the interactions of, of the electrons with their environment, which is made of other electrons and is made of the ions of, uh, of, the, of the solid. So um, um, we arrive to consider that all this interaction between many particles can be treated within a single one particle Hamiltonian, and, and this makes this, this dressed electron a quasi particle. A hole is an analogous. Uh, quasi-particles, but made of the lack of uh, an electron state in, in a crystal. Uh, a phonon yeah, are collective excitation of the atoms which vibrate due to thermal uh, energy. Magnons are spin waves, quantum of spin waves. Plasmons are excitations of, uh, uh, of plasmas, electron plasmas, for instance. Uh, polarons are interactions between electron and a polarized environment that can be just uh, 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 an octahedral polar polarized environment. And, exci and excitons are electron hole 
pairs bound together, which are particularly interesting in nano systems where we have uh, conf uh, a special confinement. And also it's very interesting to note that photon in condensed matter, when a photon enters a media, we, we need to consider as a quasi-particle because we are having the interaction of the electromagnetic wave, which in principle propagates, that propagates in vacuum at the speed of light. But when it enters a media, uh, we know that this uh, speed, we consider that is lower than the speed of light. In fact, what is lower is the resultant of the electromagnetic field that enters the material composed with all the electromagnetic field coming from the environment. So this is what defines the index of refraction that makes that the photon inside the material can even reach a zero velocity in some cases.